I'm praying tonight that God will blow our minds and blow up our hearts. Can we just pray that together? Lord, will you blow our minds and blow up our hearts? You know, this is what ought to happen when we go to church. When we show up at the house of God, our minds should be blown. Because we're not here to look at God under a microscope. We're here to meet with a creator who spoke the universe into existence. And he is so much bigger than our biggest thought, our biggest step of faith, our biggest belief, our biggest prayer, and so much greater than we've ever imagined. When we get come closer, like we're going to do today, and come one more step up on the mountain, mind's blown. But God doesn't want to just blow our minds. He could do that all day long and just have us walking around like, oh, 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 can't take it anymore. No, he wants us to know him. So he does want to blow our minds, but he also wants to blow up our hearts because he made us to fall in love with him. And that's my prayer for all of us tonight. One more step up the mountain, not of knowing more about God, but of actually becoming people who know God. And we talked about that we do this when we discover the attributes of God. And an attribute of God, just catching up from last week, is anything that God has revealed as true about himself. So we're not deciding what God is like. God is revealing what God is like. We're not the ones who are making it up as we go along. God is revealing to us as we go along and opening our eyes to see who he is, attribute by attribute by attribute by attribute. And as we study, meditate, gaze, spend time, dive in, investigate, this is how we come to know God. It's like the benches at the art gallery. Do you know there are benches in art galleries? Is this new news or old news? Old news, fake news, it's real news. Uh, <laughs> it is, uh, we're going we're gonna to verify this momentarily. Are there any art gallery people here? Oh, thank you so much, because if there were none, like in that section over there, that would make me nervous. I want us to be a, a church that's out in the world, understanding and enjoying the culture that God has made around us. Anybody been to the Louvre in Paris, France? Hello? A few people here? All right. Awesome. If you went there, you, you sure, certainly saw the, the Mona Lisa. We all go to see the Mona Lisa, but what we do oftentimes whether it's the MoMA or the High Museum or whether it's the Louvre or wherever we are, we're just there sometimes to check off the box. Like, oh, Mona Lisa, got it. Oh, there it is. A little smaller than I thought. Check. Move on to the next thing because there's a cafe we're supposed to go to because so-and-so went there. They got the best coffee in this part of Paris, so we're moving on. We'll Google the Mona Lisa in the taxi on the way and read up on it. But art wasn't created like that. Art was created to be appreciated. And so that's why there are benches in art galleries, like these that we see in these few images today. This is this first one. It's um, an amazing scene. We don't know exactly what's going on here. I'm going to, for the benefit of the doubt, assume that this family is reading up on the painting that they're looking at. You think so? No. Okay. Well, probably not. Uh, they're just tired, and probably uh, Junior over here on the right has had it, and he's playing... Um, some game on his phone. Next one is pretty great. I love this because this, anybody know this painting, this, this uh, artist? See there, amazing. That's a Rothko, and uh, that's a style. It's pretty fantastic, right? And you need a bench for this painting because you're going, wait, it's black divided by a blue bar. I'm gonna need to sit down for a moment. This next one, everybody knows what we're looking at on the wall here. This is in an in a art gallery in Israel. We're looking on the wall at a Monet. Oh, yes. Extra points right on the front row. And apparently the Monet is more awesome if you tilt your head to the left. Are you seeing it? And then we've got this last one. This is more like our generation Again, you got to respect the Jordan tongue, though. I mean, that's some serious con concentration going on right there. And I'm going to give her the benefit of the doubt. I'm going to say, because I believe in this generation, that she is on her phone 
looking up the artist, the style of art, the period, the time, the whole thing, and really diving in and appreciating the moment. See, when you go to an art gallery, you are not there to check a box. I saw the sculpture, I saw the statue, we saw the painting, we saw the relief, we saw the whatever it was, click, done, move on to the next thing. When you go to an art gallery, you really do occasionally need to take a moment and sit down and take in that work, appreciate the work, dwell on the work, meditate on the work, let it, hello, speak to you. Try to interpret what is going on here. What is happening in this moment? That's what the artist had in mind when they created the art in the first place. And if God is the one who creates the artist, then we know that what God has in mind when he invites you and me to know him, to come up on the mountain of God, is that we, we would sit on the bench and appreciate him. And definitely not be a culture that says, man, we can Google it later, or all we need need a quick selfie, and then we can scroll back and remember the moment. So I was at that concert. We sang the song. I heard the talk. We went to the thing. We did the deal. I was at Passion. We, We buzzed through church. We checked off all the boxes. And God's like, don't check me off as a box. Please come sit on the bench and appreciate who I am. And the bench is the differentiator between those who know about God and those who truly know God. And so we're going to sit on the bench for a few minutes together and talk about two more attributes of God. Last week, we talked about the holiness of God, the otherness of God, and we talked about the glory of God. Today, we're talking about the sovereignty of God and the love of God. A mind blower and a heart blower all in the same moment. So when we say God is sovereign, when we turn the person of God, which we can't, but say we could move around the person of God and see the different attributes of his character, and we come to this attribute called sovereignty, that our God, the God we're meeting with in this place is a sovereign God. What does that mean? mean, A, and why does it matter to you and me that we should sit on the bench and appreciate the sovereignty of God? What is that really all about? And we see this in the vision we talked about last week. We got holy, holy, holy in the glory of God out of Isaiah's vision in Isaiah 6, and it opens this way. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord. And here's the first thing revealed to Isaiah about God. Here's his description. I saw the Lord. He was seated on a throne. First words. What kind of throne? High and exalted. First thing, before the seraphs, before holy, 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 before the train of his robe filled the temple, before the doorpost shook, before the altar and the tongs and the grace and the mercy and the calling, before all of that, he's sitting on a throne And not just any throne, not like the one, you know, when I grew up at church, I don't know what church you grew up in, the pastor sat on like a little mini throne on the church. Anybody go to that church? Hello? Just not knocking it, but anybody remember that? And then the associate pastor had a little smaller throne. (laughs) This younger generation, they're like, they missed out on the good stuff, man. Anybody remember? Anybody church like that right over here? Okay. And then if you were just going to give your testimony, you just sat in a regular chair. See, we don't have a throne mentality, but we've got a God who is sitting enthroned, not on a semi-decent throne, not on the king or queen of XYZ country's throne, not on the slightly smaller throne. He's sitting on a throne high and exalted, meaning he has all rule and all authority, period, end of sentence. Our God is has all rule and all authority. He's sovereign. We see this in this text in 1 Timothy chapter 6. The text is about uh, the love of money and then shifting into his charge, Paul's, to his protege, Timothy, to be 
a man of character. And as he's coming down to the end of it, remember the backdrop of this is Roman Empire days, emperor days, throne days, sovereign days. But Paul's operating on a different wavelength. He sat on the bench for a while and appreciated God. And we see it bleeding in as he's talking to to young Timothy about taking the baton and carrying on the work. This is what he says. We just sort of jump in the middle in verse 14. To keep this command without spot or blame until the appearing of our Lord. Now, this is all woven into the milieu, if you will, the fabric of an empire-ruled world. We're waiting, Timothy, until our Lord appears. There is a Lord. His name is the Emperor of Rome, and he's pretty much running the show right now. In fact, he's going to end up, Paul could write, taking me out. But there's another Lord, and that's the one we're waiting for, the Lord Jesus Christ. He knows his God is sovereign. And listen to what he says about him. He says, which God will bring about. God's going to bring about what? The appearing of our Lord Jesus. And God is going to bring this about in his own time. And then he goes into a praise break. He he just loses it for a minute. He's not walking through with information about God. He actually has tasted and seen that the Lord is good. And when he says, we're waiting for our Lord to appear, and he's coming when our God decides, and he goes, oh, man, this God is amazing. And right in the middle of telling young Timothy how to take the baton and run with it, Paul just goes into a benediction, which is not uncommon for him to do. And he just breaks off right here. There's a long dash in my text between own time and the word God. God, let me tell you about God, the blessed and only ruler, the King of kings and Lord of lords, who alone is immortal and who lives in unapproachable light, whom no one has seen or can see. To him be honor and might forever. Amen. He couldn't even get past the phrase without stopping to stand in awe of a God who is blowing his mind and blowing up his heart. You're like, well, I didn't see sovereign in the text, so why did you pick that text? (laughs) I thought we were talking about the sovereign God and the sovereignty of God. Well, I picked this text because sovereignty and sovereign are in the text, but I had to dig a little bit to figure that out. I haven't memorized the Greek New Testament. I have studied New Testament Greek, and I have Greek New Testaments in my study, and Greek New Testament study helps, but I haven't memorized the whole Greek New Testament. I'm working on it, so just be patient with me. So I I thought I should, I want to dig into this text. So I did, and I'm going to show you how I did that so that you can dig into the text because sitting on the bench isn't all about feelings and staring up into the great blue sky and saying, Lord, reveal yourself to me. It's about digging into the word of God and into the person of Christ by the power of the spirit of God to unfold the richness of God so that then you can appreciate God. And, And hello, it takes a little effort. So I said, well, I've got to dig. And I I took a shortcut, and I Googled my favorite Bible website that I use, and I know I can do this quickly. I went to BibleHub.com. And if you go there, this is what's going to happen. You're going to see, uh, well, this is showing you how to search BibleHub.com in case you're there. Just got the flip phone, traded in for a real phone. This is how it works. When you go there, just type in the verse, the text you're looking for. So I typed in 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 15. When you type in 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 15, guess what? Bible Hub will take you to that passage. And when you arrive at that passage, you're going to see multiple translations of that passage. 
Now look as you see the translations up here, you see the one I'm reading. There it is, right there in black and white. The blessed and only ruler. Now that's the updated NIV. I've got the NIV, older uh, version, 84. The blessed and only ruler. Look down to New Living. It says the blessed and only almighty. Now look down one more. And uh, if we just scroll down a little bit, anybody got ESV with you tonight? English Standard Version? Few people, few people got real Bibles. Um, So you come down to here, and it says, who is the blessed and only, hello, there's my word, sovereign. You come down to the Berean Study Bible, he who is blessed and the only sovereign. Any Berean Berean Study Bibles tonight? Not a popular seller. And then down to the Berean Literal Bible, same thing, blessed and alone sovereign. And then if you go all the way down, you see all the various translations of how this text got translated from the original Greek language into English, the Bibles that you and I are using. If you go all the way down, scroll down further to King James, it says the word potentate. That's why it's the King James Bible to the only potentate. Sean, put that in a worship song. (laughs) It can be done. So now I've found my word sovereign, so I'm like, okay, I know it's there. I just need to dig a little more. So I scroll back up to the top. I look across this header line to where it says INT. That's interlinear translation. That means the English and the Greek are going to be side by side. So I click on that button because I'm already at the verse I want, and there I have English and Greek side by side. And you say, well, I don't know any of this stuff, and all you guys that went to seminary have a head start. Look, you, you can figure out a lot just by investigating. You're going to learn that the word order in Greek is different than the word order in English, just like it is in Spanish and English. But you, So you, you'll read along with the black letters, which is the Greek, and you'll see that the word order is a little bit different. But we're looking for our word. Where is it? There it is right there, sovereign. And so we found our word. And now we want to investigate what does this word mean? So I know the word, the Greek word is right there. You can see it in black, but I want to check out what that word is all about. So I'm going to click the reference number on the top, 1413. And when I click that, it takes me to a bunch of information about that Greek word. For example, um, the word is dunastes. So that's how you say it. You're like, I don't know how to say Greek. It says phonetic spelling right there in the middle. Do not taste. That's how you say this word. Um, it's a noun, and it's a masculine noun. So that's just a footnote, not trying to make a, a big giant deal out of it. But if there is anyone here today that said, uh, I think God's whoever you want him to be. No, he's not. He's who he reveals himself to be. That's who God is. And so this isn't some like generational, cultural, where you came from mindset. This is the original language that the scripture was breathed out by the Holy Spirit into. And this word right here for sovereign is a masculine noun. I didn't make that up. No guy made that up. That's how the Holy Spirit chose to give us this revelation of God. Now, God encaptures all the female attributes in the world because he's God and he created everything. So he gives birth, but he's revealing himself as a masculine here in this particular word, and in most all the places you see in Scripture. The definition is a ruler, hello, or a potentate. Hey, don't make fun of the King James just because it has the whereunto's and the therefore's and the vows and all that business. It is an excellent translation. And it got this straight on. Because it, it, it knew, I say it knew, <laughs> the people that translated the King James translation knew this word means potentate. And then they said, well, what will the, the later generations think about potentate? They won't really like potentate as much as sovereign or ruler. So let's don't go with a word they won't like. King James just said, we don't care what they think. Let's go with potentate. So there it is. It's a man who rules by force, a ruler or a potentate, again, talking about the usages, um, a courtier or a member of the court. And so I thought, man, I don't want to just park right here with a man who rules by force. I don't want to go into Passion City and say, our God is sovereign. And you know what that means, people? He's a man that rules by force. Hmm. Not quite there yet. So I dug a little deeper. I scrolled up. 
because this is what you will want to do. And I came down here to where it says word origin. See it right in the middle there? I want to know where did this word come from because Greek words come from root words, and that helps you unpack the meaning. So I clicked on the root word. You'll see it highlighted right here. Clicked on that root word, opens me up to a whole new understanding. Now I'm in a verb, duname, and the definition is to be able to have power. And then look at the three usages of this word. Number one, A, I am powerful. Number two, I actually there's just two here, but I'm highlighting, breaking them down in three ways. Secondly, I have the power. And thirdly, I am able. I can. And I was like, this is the God we came to worship tonight. Unrivaled rule, unassailable throne, and he's able and he can. He's able and he can what? He's able to do whatever he wants to do, and he can. Because he's sitting on a throne that is high and exalted, and it stretches and blows our minds. It causes our minds to stretch because one of the philosophical questions it's going to raise for us, and if God is sovereign, then where did evil come from? Why is there evil? And why is evil still here if God is able? And if he can, why doesn't he just get rid of that? Or why was there that in the first place? And I obviously can't answer that in two minutes. But somewhere woven into it is God's willingness, though he's seated on a throne that is high and exalted, to give you and I the free will to make decisions as free agents in life. Think about that. But above all of that is God. So at the beginning, when he wanted a universe, he said, I, I would like a cosmos. And I'm able. And I can. And so out of nothing, God created everything. Because he was able. And because he could. In that universe, he created man. And with man came all kind of collateral damage. Because with our freedom of choice given to us by this God, we chose to walk away from God and not toward him, to do it our way and not his way. And so now the world is filled with all of the downstream damage of those choices, and they continue to happen second after second after second every single day. But it doesn't stop God from being sovereign. Because think about you. God wanted you in his cosmos. Think about that. You are no accident. You are God's design. But some of you, the circumstances by which you came into the world are backwards and chaotic. You try not to think about it, but you figured out through conversation that your parents had like a heated moment and voila. Or one or both of your parents are not even in your story. Someone came into the moment, and before you even breathed, went out of the moment. Chaotic. The downstream collateral of sin. But God, the whole time, was seated, sitting high and exalted. And so he was saying, I want you. The, the circumstances were all wrong and chaotic, and he took the all wrong and chaotic circumstances and did a miracle, and he created you because he had always intended for there to be a you. He was sovereign even over the brokenness to fulfill his desire to have you in the cosmos with him. And he's sovereign over every circumstance and every season and every ruler and every earthly potentate. He raises up one one day and puts down another one the next day. 
And he does what he wants, how he wants, when he wants. And we see in this text, Jesus is coming when? When God says he's coming. He's coming at God's time because God right now at the same time, outside of time, is standing at the beginning of time and at the end of time. He's not trapped in 2019. Looking around like, how's it going so far? He's standing right now at the beginning of time. And he's standing right now at the end of time. And his sovereign plans are over all of time. And so here we are in this little tiny sliver called our lives, which is so small, there's no way you could even illustrate how tiny our lives are in the expanse of the eternity of a sovereign God. And he's at the beginning of it all, not our lives, the beginning of it all, and at the end of it all right now. So there should be an an, an inhale of, whoa, that makes my mind hurt, and I can't philosophically figure all that out right away. But it should blow us up with encouragement tonight to know that our lives are being lived out in the fabric of a God who right now, currently, as we're talking to him and worshiping him, stands at the beginning of time and at the end of time, and is over time and everything in time, because he is sitting on the throne. And when all the other thrones are dismantled and deteriorated, he's still going to be sitting on his. But then there's the love of God, which is an amazing attribute of God. Given that there's so much mind-bending thought in the sovereignty of God. So we're not coming to to grips with a a potentate. That's why I'm so glad we got sovereign ruler. We're coming to grips with a sovereign ruler who is madly in love with us. (laughs) And what kind of love? Not the kind you're thinking about. And the kind I'm thinking about. Not I'm stumped right now because I got to pick an emoji and I don't know which one to pick. (laughs) Not that kind of love. Is this a pink heart love? Is this a double beating heart love emoji? Is this a Cupid heart love emoji? Is this a yellow heart love emoji, which I don't even know what that means? Hi, friend. (laughs) You're awesome. You definitely think twice about using that red one. Oh, <laughs> then there's the black heart, the green heart. I like the black heart. It's like, yeah, <laughs> true love. <laughs> I'm not sure what it means. I don't really know if it's good or bad. I just use it a lot because I can't pick the other colors sometimes. When we think about love, we think about emotions, we think about sexuality, we think about compassion, and there are lots of words in Scripture for love, mostly the ones that talk about brotherly love, passionate love, and brotherly love. A benevolent love, a passionate love, and a brotherly love, if I didn't get that right. But there's another love talked about in the Bible, and this is the love that we see describing this attribute of our God. It's not just benevolence, I feel sorry for you. Oh, bless you, let me try to help you. It's not just brotherly like, oh, okay, here we go, man. And it's definitely not a sexual kind of love. So what kind of love is it when we say God is passionately or madly in love with you? What kind of love are we talking about? We're talking about this kind that we see in 1 John chapter 4. Such a crystal clear picture. In verse 9, this is how God showed his, here's our word, love among us. So what kind of love are we talking about? Some kind of major love. He sent his, here's how he showed us his love. He, He didn't go down the emojis and try to pick one. He sent his one and only son 
into the world that we might live through him. This is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. We read down to verse 15. If anyone acknowledges that Jesus is the son of God, and that's not an assent, that's a life commitment belief, then God lives in him and he in God. And so we know and rely on the love God has for us. God, say it with me, is love. Now, what the writer is not saying is that love and God are the same thing. Because we've seen that already because we know God is not just love. He's also a sovereign ruler. And he's also holy and set apart. And he also has the most weight and worth of anything ever created or uncreated. And so he's not just love. So it's not like, oh, God, he's just a, he's just a big mountain of love. And we're going up the mountain of God, up the mountain of love and love and God and God and love. No, he's more than love. But we see in Scripture that love is one of the primary motivators of God. It's the attribute that's fueling the action and the activity and the direction and the path of God. In fact, it's so strong and powerful that ultimately it's causing him of his own volition to give as sacrificially as possible for people who haven't earned it and don't deserve it. It's agape love. That's the word right there. When you get your Bible hub open, and go to this text in 1 John and click on the word love, you're going to get agape. The highest, purest, most sacrificial kind of love that anyone can even fathom. And you know what I learned when I dug a little deeper under agape? I found the most amazing idea. In the word agape is the word prefer. God prefers you. He's not just tolerating you. He takes delight in you. He takes pleasure in you. And here's the best part. It's a pre-existing condition. that jettisons out of jettisons us out of the the trap a of i'm not worthy of god's love like some of us are living in i'm not worthy of anybody's love i don't even love myself and surely god wouldn't love me i mean look at my track record look at my flaws look at how jacked up my life is surely god wouldn't love me Second silo we need to get blown out of is the one that says, surely God would love me. I mean, look at me. (laughs) Third silo we got to get blown out of is, I don't feel loved. See, agape wasn't based on a feeling. It was based on a desire. And the desire of this God who's seated high and above everything else in existence, who has all this rule and authority, he moved out of love toward you. And and it wasn't a feeling. It wasn't God going, I feel so in love with you. It was, I prefer you to be with me. I desire that you be with me. I delight in you, and I want you to be with me. And that's going to require me to love you with the highest Zenith of love imaginable. I'm going to have to trade the innocence of my son for the guilt and the shame that is in your life so that I then can open my arms to you and welcome you home as a son or a daughter of a sovereign king. There is a sovereign God, make no mistake, who is ruling the affairs of the world, and he is madly in love with you. And he has moved heaven and earth to love you. And it's not rooted in a feeling, it's rooted in a reality, namely the cross of Jesus Christ. 
So do we all feel it every day? Of course we don't. But when we don't feel it, we don't go, well, I guess God doesn't love me. When we don't feel it, we go back to our foundation, which is the cross, and we go, I'm not feeling it right now, but I'm just going to sit down on the bench for a minute and drink in the cross of Jesus. And I guarantee you, a few minutes on the bench drinking in the cross of Jesus, your feelings are going to start getting on board with the reality and the truth of what God is revealing to us about himself at the cross. I found this quote reading uh, A.W. Tozer, which there'll be an A.W. Tozer quote in each of the messages in this series, but it blew me away. I had not really um, sat and pondered it before. He said, it is a strange and beautiful eccentricity of the free God that he has allowed his heart to be emotionally identified with men. And that love, that's the definer of who you are. And it should be the motivator of what you do. And it speaks so much life to us in the messy middle to know that we're coming to know a sovereign, loving God, a ruler who is in love with us. You gotta have that in the messy middle. I know for me, it was salvation for me in the messy middle of my life when this painting was hanging on my wall at our campus ministry at Baylor University in Texas. So if you came to visit me, came to have a chat, about life goals or about God's purpose or about boys or girls or whatever the case or about God or scripture or something, you walked into my office, you were going to see this hanging on the wall in my office. And most of you uh, have heard the story about my dad being a very talented artist. And some of you have actually seen the paintings or heard me talk about them before. But my dad did the Chick-fil-A logo. Most people know that. If you didn't, I just like to keep saying it. 1964. He did the original logo for Cumberland Mall, for crying out loud. But he worked as his day job as a graphic designer, Coca-Cola cartons and Tropicana orange juice and all, all that kind of stuff. But he really had like the chops to be an abstract artist. And abstract art is not ra- uh, haphazard and random. That's the way most people think. Oh, yeah, I could be an abstract artist. I mean, you just throw a bunch of paint on the wall and then you go, there you have it, people. <laughs> 20 grand for that one. I'll give you the smaller one for 10 grand. Now, it's, it's really something. And so my dad would disappear a lot of times on a Saturday, go back to his place of work, stay sometimes overnight, come home on Sunday with, we got all kind of abstract art in my house and my sister's house from my dad's work. And one day my dad comes home with the biggest painting you've ever seen. I don't even know how he got it in the car. I'm not sure, I still to this day don't know how he got it home. It just appeared and we had really moved up in that point in our lives into a townhouse and we were living in a house with two, two floors. Hello, thank you very much. I was in college and we'd made it. And um, so the only place this painting would fit was on the wall at the top of the stairs at the landing. If you, if you live in a two-story, multi-story house, check this out. When you go home tonight, or if you're in an apartment complex and you're going upstairs outside, just notice when you go up the stairs, there has to be a big giant wall there at the landing, and the painting fit, fit there. It was an abstract magician, because I was kind of into doing magic tricks at that season of my life. I know, maybe I'll do one, one, one Sunday at the five, but my dad maybe was motivated by that. I'm not sure. And so he, he comes home with this giant abstract magician, gets me to help him affix it to the wall at the top of the landing. My mom hated it. Hated it. I mean, hated the art, hated how big it was, hated all of it. I thought it was fantastic. But I forgot to tell this buddy of mine on a Saturday night, and we were coming in after curfew and trying to tiptoe up the stairs, you know, not to wake up mom and dad. No kidding. And we get to the landing, and this guy goes, whoa! I was like, oh, sorry. Should have told you about the abstract magician looming down from the top of the ceiling at the top of the landing. But a college student would walk in, and this actually did happen. I'm not making it up. And, you know, a college student walking in, trying to figure out Louie's office real quick, like, okay, I got you now. And then he looks over at the wall, and he goes, what is that on your wall? It looks like someone threw up on the wall. (laughs) 
And I would normally just say, yeah, it's, a, it's abstract art. My dad did it. It's part of a bigger painting. But every now and then, I just wasn't in the mood. And I would say, yeah, um, my dad did that. And then he became disabled because of a brain virus, and they had to do surgery and take part of his brain out. And it was the part where his artistic ability resided. And then he was seven years disabled, never went back to work, never did art, never addressed himself, never drove a car. And then he died, and he did that. No, I didn't really do that, <laughs> but twice. <laughs> but I would just tell people, my dad did it as part of a bigger painting. Because when, when others would walk in and see it, they would just see like, I don't even know, what is that? I actually think it's pretty awesome all by itself. But when I would look at it, I saw the whole thing. Because the compromise of mom and dad was... We kept the painting, we just made it smaller. And you can do that with abstract art. Dad said, one Saturday, Ace, I need your help. Took the painting out on the back patio, put it on two dining room chairs, and took a circular saw and chopped off the top and the bottom and the sides. And then my dad trimmed the frame down, reframed it, put it back on the wall. And when my dad passed away, I was at that townhouse helping my mom move, and in the coat closet downstairs behind all the coats up against the wall in the back of the coat closet was the bottom of the abstract magician. And I just, I grabbed it out of there and I thought, no way! And all the memories of that day came flooding back and I was like, oh my, wow, this was the greatest day of all! We took that thing out on the patio and sawed it up in pieces. I, I don't remember how this got in the coat closet, but I'm taking it to Texas and framing it and putting it in my office. Because the real abstract magician is still up on the landing until my mom moved and then my mom passed away. And now it's in my landing. And it, it looks like this. And so when I saw this, I always saw that. Because most of life is this. I thought you were supposed to be sovereign. I thought you loved me. What is going on? And unless we've been on the bench and appreciated the throne that our God sits on, we lose the plot in the messy middle. And unless we're building on something that's sunk in reality and not in feelings, we completely lose our way with God in the messy middle. But I'm telling you, I always saw a bigger painting You can see we buzz some off the right. <laughs> we buzz some off the left. We buzz some off the top. This thing was giant. But when I saw this, I always saw that. Our sovereign God, well, he too is painting on a canvas bigger than you can think or imagine. He is working right now for his glory and your good on a canvas that is bigger than you can see and bigger than you can imagine. And if you don't know that he's sovereign, you think He's gone, or he's weak, or he doesn't care. But when he sees the snapshot you're in right now, which is probably all we can see, he's standing back 
at the beginning of time and the end of time, looking at the whole story. And he's saying, listen, baby girl, I know it doesn't make a lot of sense right here, but wait till you see the finished work. Wait till you see the whole painting. Wait until you see what your sovereign king has done in your life. And until then, you just keep anchored in the cross. Because that's the place where the sovereignty of God and the love of God are merged into one grand painting for us to have a seat and behold. They crushed Jesus. But God was sitting higher. Peter tried to stop him by whacking off a guy's ear. And Jesus said, sorry, man. He doesn't know about the canvas. But you came to arrest me, right? I'm ready. And at the cross, Jesus didn't hang there and say, it's a feeling. He hung there and said, it is finished. You've got a pre-existing condition. And it is that you are being pursued by a sovereign who's madly in love with you. Is he your king? He is a king, but is he your king? He's on a throne. But is it my throne? Is it the throne that I'm bowed down before today? Or am I still at another throne, a little smaller throne, or even a little smaller throne, or maybe I'm on a throne? And am I living? Can I say what they said in 1 John 4? We have come to know, and we're relying on, we're believing in the love that God has for us. Nothing is happening in your world that is above the sovereign reign of your God. And you can trust him, even in the chaos, because he climbed up every mountain and lit up every shadow and tore down every wall coming after you.